So I'd like to turn to, to my guests now and, and just ask them a, a series of questions, really. So, so um, first of all, um, uh, perhaps if I could start with Sarah, if you don't mind. Sarah, um, just how do you describe the NSSL community to colleagues and friends who have not heard about it? A very good question. And why, why haven't they heard of it is my first question. Um, <laughs> but, um, in, you know, in, in all seriousness, I guess the NHSR community, the way I describe it to people who've not heard of it before, is that it really is a, a community. And to kind of give you a bit of my backstory, how I came to R and, and the R community, um, a lot like Chris, I started off using R very much in isolation. And the thing that drew me to it was actually its ability to um, to chop up and analyze free text data. And this, exactly like Paul describes, when you get that text, that text code going and you can automate churning through thousands and thousands of lines of documents, it, it, it is, your eyes do light up. It's like being in a sweet shop and just thinking, my goodness me. So R and its ability to automate processes, I was delighted with. But it was me and perhaps about two other people at the time in the Department of Health and Social Care who could see the advantages and the power of, of it. And you, you did get this feeling after a while, as, as well as being quite lonely, a little bit of a feeling of, am I talking a different language here? Am I going mad? When you talk to other people and you try and convince them and they just look at you blankly, we've got Excel. What do we need? What do we need this for? <laughs> um, and the battles that we had to with IT to get the thing installed. And it was like pulling teeth. So when I finally became aware of, of the NHSR community, and I was one of the people at that conference in, in Birmingham that you mentioned, it was like I had found my people. It was just amazing. And as you say, because you are so delighted that you found people who are enthusiastic, um, you just want to help and share and contribute as, as much as you can. Um, and so for me, the NHSR community, to be honest, represents, I would say, the absolute best of the data and analytics community in that it is fun, it is people who just believe in and really want beautiful solutions <laughs> to problems. And also are people who generally work hands-on in the NHS with the data day in day out and can just see how valuable it is and, and really want to wring out every last drop of, of that of that value and the nhsr community i think really represents all all, all of those things sarah thank you that's amazing uh, jenny do you want to come in at all oh thanks mohammed sarah i couldn't agree more absolutely and i'll just add a, a few bits to that so to me the NHSR community is a great place for those to get started, but also for those to improve because there's always more to learn and there's all sorts of people really willing to engage. For me, I'm also thrilled that it's welcoming and in line with those NHS values um, that you've mentioned at the start there, Mohammed, about sharing. It's for patients and it's about improving the work that we do, the work that helps our patients as well. The other um, real uh, boon I think with the NHSR community is uh, when we as analysts are maybe uh, looking to recruit and we're working with universities um, it's really helpful to say to those universities look it's not just financial organizations who are recruiting people with these skills um, we've got these different forums that we can point people towards so the NHSR community I believe helps raise that profile as well in the potential pool of analysts not just uh, within the analysts within our uh, community already. That's great, Jenny. Thank you. Um, Paul, um, you're a founder member of the community. So how do you describe it to colleagues? Um, I, for me, it's, I would describe it as more as that the old fashioned concept of, co of a cooperative in the way in which the cooperative was originally formed back in the, at the turn of the previous century. Or, or, or a society of friends for analysts. It's that, you know, we, we bandy around the word community quite easily, but it, it, it is exactly that thing. And um, it's that coming together. And um, so, yeah, I, that's how I describe it to, um, to, uh, to colleagues and friends, really. 
Thank you. Uh, Chris, um, you were the Lone Ranger for R for a long time. So how do you describe the community? Uh, well, you know, I actually bet pretty heavy on R in my career, you know, and they were, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I think it would be about 2016, 2017. I genuinely started thinking that I'd throw my whole life away. I was like, this, this, you know, I'm never going to get to the pot of gold at the end of this rainbow. I've learned all these skills. No one cares. No one's listening to me. And it's all toast. And then suddenly the almost overnight the exact opposite happened people were falling out of the sky dropping you know all over the country people wanted to talk to me about art so um yeah i mean the big thing that i think a lot of people have already said is uh, the thing that i always say about the nhsr community is that we share that's the core value and i think to people who don't work in the nhs a lot of people who work outside the nhs think that we work for the nhs so you work for the nhs and we all sit in a big organization and help each other and i'm very sorry to say that's not the case actually we're all in little tiny 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 buildings dotted around and b being explicitly allowed to share and cooperate is surprisingly controversial even for socialized healthcare a lot of people outside the nhs don't understand that and that's why I love the NHSR community, because by if your manager allows you to engage with our community, they are explicitly allowing you to work across organizational boundaries. And that's very, very, very powerful. The other thing I would say about NHSR, which is a concept I bor borrowed from Hadley Wickham, who, as most people will know, is widely regarded as probably the preeminent R programmer, is he always says, that, I love this, uh, this it, 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 he said it in a talk once, that, that code is a force multiplier. So if you have a little piece of code, if you write, you know, four lines of code that can do one thing over and over again, that becomes a very, very powerful tool. And he talked very eloquently about the way that you can build up a sort of repertoire of, of tools. And those tools become a force multiplier. They can be shared, they can be repurposed. And so a very small amount of effort actually can be leveraged across an extremely large thing. And I do, listening to what everyone's been saying about the history, um, I think that's the thing that I really love about the NHSR community is that it's a force multiplier because the NHSR community, when you compare it with the money that the NHS spends on, you know, licensing software and giving to, you know, analytical consultants and all the tens, hundreds of thousands of pounds the NHS pays with taxpayers' money going to private companies. When you look at the amount of money that we spent on NHSR and when you look at the amount of development and the amount of sharing and the amount of work and the amount of energy that's come out of that, I think it's a, it's an order of magnitude more valuable. We're getting an order of magnitude more return on our investment than we ever would. And this is obviously something that was in the, um, the Health Foundation report that we were talking about before, is this idea that by investing in people and by giving people space and time and help to share and work together, that you can build something much, much, much bigger than your initial investment. And that's the, other than sharing, which is the first thing I always say, that's the thing that I always say. And I, the other thing, I was bragging to my kids last night, actually, fun enough, they do not care. Um, we punch well above our weight. I always say that to everyone in my NHSR. I see NHSR, I mean, we were big news in the R community, the conference we mentioned before, the most recent conference. I was seeing people in America talking about our conference because it was so awesome. They were like, they didn't really know what NHS, they didn't know anything about it, but they'd heard there was this massive community of R having an awesome conference. And I was so proud because I was like, you know, I, I felt like such a tiny, you know, like we were just this little tiny fish in a tank. And then I realized that actually we were doing something really, really, really good um, with others that are comparatively little. That's great, Chris. Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to pick up on, well, there's so much to pick up on there, but I'm just going to focus on one point and really ask us to see if Paul might elaborate on this. Paul, uh, you were a co-author on a very important paper about 21st century data analytics. Just say a little bit about that and how, and how the NHSR community kind of got mentioned in that work. Yeah, so this was... Um... This was a piece of work. Alan mentioned um, a chap called Martin Bardsley, who was at the Health Foundation. And so Martin and myself, and um, actually the, the analytical community in certain ways, it's, it's a kind of usual suspect. It's quite, it's quite a small number of people involved uh, once you delve into it. The, we got together with a chap called Ben Goldager, who works at Oxford University. And Ben very much is coming from a public health research perspective. Martin was coming from the basis of the, of the work that he'd done around um, raising the profile of, of analytics in the, health, in the health sector. And I was coming from professionalizing it from an, from an AFA perspective. And we all got ahead together and decided that we just needed to raise the profile of the discussion. And the, the best way to do that was to get something published. So we thought, well, 
let you know let let's let's see if we can get something in the BMJ and um, and get the discussion going because if we could engage some of the clinical community as well as the senior leaders we might be on to get so so we held a series of meetings um, and we had a, a very useful I think we called it a breakfast meeting at a, a nice place in London and um, got everybody together senior leaders across the system and as a result of that um, we then had a writing group who met in Oxford to write the paper and it was really as Sarah said earlier a lot of NHS analytics are mired in in the ubiquity of Excel and old-fashioned ways of working and are not really efficient or particularly useful moves so the premise of the paper was how do we make sure that we bring all of that stuff into a system which is fit for purpose in the 21st century um, and NHSR I think Mohammed you were involved you were involved in that breakfast meeting which we had originally and it was a good example of of the sorts of things that we can do if we can mobilize the energy uh, of the collective and get the hive mind approach going around all this and what we can do so that was used as an example in that paper and that paper was published in the journal of the royal society of medicine about 2020. yes and so, and so I, obviously I, as an ac academic uh, publication is something that kind of is 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 uh, an important uh, kind of output for academia mm. but but i just want to perhaps underscore chris's point really that the nhsr community was noticed Mm. And, and, and it, it, wasn't, it was noticed not because it was seeking to be noticed, but actually it was just trying to do good stuff with, with really uh, amazing people, really. And mm -hmm. quite a few of those people generally had been undiscovered or uh, under-discovered under in their own settings, really. Yeah. So, so, um, okay, well, so, so I'm now going to perhaps, um, I'm going to ask each one of you um, to share a story, any story, really. Uh, uh, that 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 um, kind of uh, say something about uh, uh, about kind of the NHSR community from your perspective or from someone someone you know. Um, so I'm going to start with um, Jenny. Could I ask you first, if I may, please? So we we have had many, I think, here in Wales, which is really exciting. Um, but it's interesting hearing others talk about how they're using R. And I think some of ours are maybe in a slightly different space around this. So some of the initial, the real quick wins following the training were very much in terms of automation of what was some really manual spade work of wrangling data, be it actually pulling from SQL, be it um, reports that people were sending that an analyst had to compile uh, manually. Um, so that wrangling of the data, but also that compiling of multiple reports, for example, across 20 different specialties, different sites, etc. So just that automation, I think, was the real um, key moment for a lot of um, analysts within the NHSR community in Wales to say, actually, I can use this and it's not that hard. I can Google a bit of code and I can actually get it working. It might not be the most beautiful, but I can get something working and it will make my life easier. Um, some of the others, though, that exist is um, more interestingly, recently, um, I've got a very junior analyst in the team who was given a model uh, by another member of the team that I'm going to say the, the magic word of, of it was an Excel based model. And for him to be able to understand that model, actually, because he's very strong in R, he rewrote the model in R in order to understand it. And what that meant is that we went from what was unfortunately quite an opaque box model because it was lots of formulas sort of all twisting around in Excel to and also a very large file size to now a really clear box model, which is, is what we're all really looking for is that transparency about how our methods are working so that we can encourage that validation and verification. And so that member of the team really did a lovely job of uh, using the tool that was R to help him understand something that he was entirely new to. And ultimately, the byproduct was a really, really useful tool that then has actually been used in multiple projects since then. So a huge success story um, from my perspective uh, of us being able to use someone's R skills to completely benefit NHS Wales particularly. Thank you, Jenny. I, th I think that point about uh, analysts being able to do things to make life uh, to, to kind of create some time at work um, so that they can kind of 
uh, free up some some time from doing repetitive tasks. I think that's really important because one of the constraints on 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 learning and development in any job role tends to be lack of time. But to be able to do that, and then I was just noting that um, this point about uh, code is a is a as a multiplier. Um, this, you, I think I think that's just been illustrated by what you what you've said. So thank you. Um, can I ask? Um, uh, Ellen, please, uh, any story from your perspective, please. Thank you. Yeah, so I think the significance of the NHSR community to me is not simply the achievements that they've managed to um, to do within their own project, but also alongside so many of the other advancing analytics projects that have come before and after them. So we funded 43 in total and just so many of them have been uh, supported by the NHSR community. One that comes to mind is um, Seb Zeki from Guys in St Thomas, who's a gastroenterologist that leads another project. Seb's tool, Endominer, has been chosen as one of the solutions that are being taken forward um, for development and for wider application. And so I suppose that's just one example of many that um, is demonstrative of how the NHSR community is so generous with their time and um, and always eager to learn from other kind of clever and innovative people in the system. Uh, so for me, it's just a real pleasure to be able to be some sort of data cupid for <laughs> all of those people, um, for you, Mohammed, you, and for anyone else that's um, doing really, really great work in the system. Thank you, thank you, Ellen. That's really interesting how how actually it's it's kind of supported the investments that you're making in other projects. Uh, and that kind of leverage is uh, uh, across really uh, because of the uh, of the, uh, the amazing people we have in the community. Um, um, Sarah, do you have a story at all to share with us? Um, so yeah, building building on on, on what Ellen and, and um, Jenny have said, the the um, the proliferation of R is really the thing for me. So talking about when I was one of three trying to use it for text analysis. Where I think where we are now, you know, we've come on so far. So building on the text analysis story that I had, I, I cobbled together some code. I could use it to look at free text in surveys and consultation responses and tweets. And that was great. Um, that was just me doing that. And then I eventually managed to make contact Weekly with catch up, some... Nikki B, Jen B, Sarah C. Sorry if that just interrupted the recording um, okay, okay. <laughs> the um was then able to kind of pass that code on to people who worked on the the nhs staff survey every year and every year they got all these free text comments from various different members of, of, of nhs staff and they were able to take that code and not only were they able to use it they then improved it massively and made it so much better than i could have done and that is the beauty of r and so then when we um were plunged into in more recent times, COVID response. Um, within NHS England and improvement in NHSX, we put together an enormous data and modeling cell. And, um, you know, everyone's panic stations, how, how is the NHS resources gonna cope with all this? Everyone's putting together models in their own little areas. One of the models, one of the big models was, was built initially in Excel. And it was, this is a testament to how far we've come that we instantly recognize that that model had to be taken out of Excel and put into R. And so that task was done as a matter of priority and it was absolutely fundamental for them being able to share that model with other groups and for them to take it, add on their bit or improve it. And that, that is, is really, I think, a, a huge success story for, for the use of R in the R community in the NHS. And, and I think, uh, thank you, that is uh, amazing. And also that point about it's been done under an emergency mm. uh, environment, really. It was, it was absolutely uh, prioritised, exactly. It wasn't yeah. just a nice to have, this had uh, to happen. It had to get converted into R. And and under an emergency, especially if it's not been rehearsed, so data science doesn't usually get rehearsed as part of an emergency response. So to go to your familiar tools is, is an intuitive, instinctive response, really. But for that to be recovered that quickly is actually astonishing. So, uh, uh, so that's great to hear. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Paul, please. I guess, I guess the one which springs to mind is around the national planning round. So each year in the NHS, 
all of the organizations who work in acute care have to produce a set of forecasts for activity around things like outpatient appointments and inpatients and various other activity lines. And they get submitted into a central body, which um, was in NHS England and Improvement. And the, the task at the center was to assess the quality of those plans and provide feedback. Um, and we had no real way of doing that systematically. So once we got into the whole thing of using R as a forecasting tool, we then wrote uh, a, a set of analyses which meant we could take all of the activity from all of the organisations and run that. So for 150 organisations across eight planning lines, across various methodologies of forecasting like Holt Winters or TBATs or, or, or regression analyses, and then pick the best fit model, which we could then use to assess the quality of their returns. Pre, we would never do that in Excel, it was just an impossible task. But those 6,000 separate beats of analysis, we managed to turn around that in, in, the, in the space of an hour. So when stuff comes back in, we can then do a compare and contrast across that. Now that's now then made available through an R Shiny app back out to the organizations themselves. So there's a whole transparency around how are we at the center assessing the quality of the plans that you're producing. And of course, what we find is they now use that methodology out within the organizations because they know that's how they're being assessed. But it's a much better statistically robust way of doing it than we ever could have achieved before. And that for me, and that's just accepted, that's an accepted practice now. And that's only taken two years. Now, if you know about any embedding anything in the NHS, it's taken <laughs> an awful lot longer than two years. That's, 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 that's great to hear, Paul. Thank you. And I know that, that that work was actually presented at one of our conferences as well, and it mm. was it was very well received. Um, Chris, uh, any stories from you, please? Uh, yes, I suppose. I mean, I've got a good story in the sense that, uh, as I mentioned before, I sort of learned R in the bad old days on my own. Um, but one of my team, Zoe, um, I think her journey aligns nicely with NHSR. I think she was on pretty much the first intro to, NH to an intro to R that yes, was run. Yes, yes. Um, and that's when I met her. So I sort of met her at the beginning of her journey. Um, so she was very accomplished in SQL, as many people in the NHSR. It's, uh, I think, uh, widely used to the point of overuse, frankly, in my opinion. Um, and so since then, she's... Um, She's learned an awful lot, um, so it's, it's a very short amount of time, and she's now got to the point where she's uh, she's doing package development, she's writing shiny applications, um, and not only that, but she's also become you know a senior figure within the NHSR community, uh, as, you know, in her own right. Um, so she's definitely the the, the uh, what I would call the absolute expert in intro to our training. She's run more intro to our training courses than anybody else. She's got it down to an absolute T by now. Um, she, I think, communicates very effectively with learners because of that, which is very important. I think someone mentioned earlier, uh, oh yes, yeah, so after the terrified. Um, so I think Zoe is very good at dealing with the terrified um, through long experience. Um, and she's got loads of stuff planned in terms of making our intro to our course better. Um, quite, you know, and again, classic NHSR, a lot of which has just come straight from her. That's the that's what I always say about um, my field in data science is that all the really best stuff is all done with no no manager asks for it. No one sits and writes a report and says, let's do this. Some bright spark comes up with the idea and off they go. And that Zoe, I think, illustrates that very uh, clearly. Um, and the other success story I probably would mention also is Ped, um, who's uh, a data scientist that I know. Uh, and she has um, also become a very important member of the community very rapidly. Um, and again, classic NHSR, she's the reason why we um, started mentoring. Um, so I think she just came on, I, people just come onto the general channel occasionally and just say, hey, you know, has anyone ever thought about doing this? And within an hour, you know, 17 people usually sort of pipe up and say, what a brilliant idea, which I have to say, that's why this podcast happened. Same thing again. Some bright spark in this case, me saying, hey, let's do this. Um, and as a consequence, you know, loads of people, including Ped, have started uh, mentoring and being mentored. And as I always say, this is stuff. NHSR is doing the stuff that should have been provided by people in the centre years ago. It, it's, a, it's a group of people who 
just spontaneously come up and do things that someone should have put in place for them right from the start and we all know why they didn't uh and it's it's a, it's a way of just diverting the energy and the enthusiasm that we all have uh in order to help each other and just giving people the freedom to you know to to find what they find useful and to do what they find useful and to help each other thank you chris i think i think uh, if i summarize that in some ways uh, if i can is i i'm seeing a story of of the uh the working lives of individuals being transformed uh, uh, uh and i'm also seeing the story of organizational processes being transformed uh, which i think is actually uh, uh, an absolute delight really um and and yes th and uh, uh, this notion of it it's become a social movement really um which will uh, which will outlive its founders quite rightly. So I'm just going to do a last question now before we sign off. Thank you everybody for, for bearing with me. Um, perhaps I'll start with Sarah. Um, Sarah, if you had a wish for the future for the NHSR community, just, just give us a quick sense of what you'd wish and then I'll go around everybody else. Thank you. Um, I think my wish for the NHSR community is for for it to just go even more mainstream um, and for it to really become, a, as it already is to a certain extent, a cornerstone and, and the voice of innovative analytics in, in the NHS and, and, and beyond in health and care. And, and Sarah, and I think with the, the, having you and NHS Access Strategic Partners, I feel that that, uh, that uh, connectedness to ensure that can happen or increase the likelihood of that happening has been enhanced really so we are grateful for uh, for that and hopefully that can uh, that can mature into something amazing as we both wish um paul please i think in some ways um it would be lovely to see the need for for it disappear in some ways um, for it to be for us to be the architects of its own downfall, which would mean we've been so successful, it's embedded in the NHS already and, and the centre would pick it up, perhaps as Chris was talking about earlier. Um, unlikely, um, maybe a pipe dream, but I, I would say if that doesn't happen, I would, would like to see the expansion of the community to be an umbrella for other data science activity and open source software and we put our arms around the python community and the jamsim community and and other people and kind of bring that into the fold so we create a much more eclectic and uh, uh, an inclusive community which is not just about r and i think that would fit nicely in with the ethos of the health foundation and AFA. actually thank you paul that's really interesting um ellen please thanks mohammed so i was thinking about this and i guess where are we now 2021 I would like to imagine that maybe 2026, we're back at the annual conference in November, maybe we're back in Edge Boston, um, in person even, wouldn't that be exciting? Um, I would love it if we were hearing from social care providers and commissioners that are telling stories about how the, how well, how the community has transformed the way that they use data and helping them make sense of the information that they collect and harness the power of analysis themselves to better analyze that information. I don't know, perhaps it's about lived experience or uh, how to provide domiciliary care in a really efficient way. So I think there's many, many more issues and problems in the system that are can, you know, is really, really well positioned to tackle. Wouldn't that be great? Ellen, thank you. And that's a really good point. Although we have lots of people in the community who are from social care and kind of uh, kind of wider, wider than the, NS, the National Health Service. Um, but I think we, we haven't profiled social care as well. So that, that's a really good, good ask for us. And I think uh, uh, what, a bit of homework for us to, uh, to, to focus on there. Um, Jenny, please. Oh, thank you, Mohammed. I, I agree with the points being raised and um, lovely to think of uh, a, a meetup in person um, at this point in time. For me, I think my hope and dream for all of this would be that um, the community expands to the point where um, it, it's that confirmation that it's not just analysts 
you don't just have to be an analyst or you don't only have to be an analyst in order to get involved in the NHSR community. Um, we welcome dabblers. We welcome those who have got uh, maybe uh, eight different coding languages under their belt, but we also welcome those who are completely new to it. So for me, it would be about um, bringing in a closer those customers of analytics so those users of some of those things that those analysts are producing so that um, actually we've got um, upskilled individuals across our health and care system who help themselves to uh, that lovely code that that has been created and maybe ask um, some analytical support to maybe do some tweaks or to improve it um, that that would be a, a real dream so uh, for example, planners and operational managers would be some of those key ones that I'd, I'd like to see. That's lovely, actually. Thank you. And again, that's a nice challenge for us to, uh, to focus on. Um, and Chris, please, your thoughts on the future. Well, I'm going to bang one of my drums, actually. I bought loads of drums, but I haven't banged any of them yet. So I'm going to, I'm going to take my, <laughs> my final chance. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to do a Tony Blair and answer my own question as well, partly. I think uh, what I would really like to see for the NHSR community is, I mean, we've talked about some of the core values of the NHSR community. So what I always say our core values are or, and our behavior is that we share, we operate across organizational boundaries and we share our code. We open source our code. And that's what we do. The NHSR community funds projects. And what's one of the conditions is that you have to share your code. And I think the NHSR community is awesome enough, frankly. So what I would like to see the future of the NHSR community, I would like to see the rest of the NHS look at us and look at our core values and start to build that into what they're doing. Because I, frankly, I think that's where the improvement needs to be now. I think those values of sharing, working across organization boundaries and sharing of code are obvious to the point of being uh, trivial. And um, I think, you know, frankly, the, the, uh, frankly, I think the rest of the system have got a lot to learn for us. So that's what I would like to see the future of NHSR. That's great. Thank you, Chris. Um, and from my point of view, I just want to keep the lights on because everything else is just so amazing. So uh, I'll, I'll close at that. I would really like to thank all my guests for, for giving time and sharing and kind of in this kind of look back exercise, which um, uh, which uh, I've found really uh, uh, refreshing to hear. Uh, and I hope it's been interesting for, for everybody else to hear. So a big thank you to my guests and everybody else for listening to this podcast. And we look forward to perhaps welcoming you to future podcasts. Thank you very much.